Hi, and welcome to the Path to Profit podcast. I'm Dr. Minette Riordan here with my husband, Brad Dobson. And welcome. today, welcome, welcome. And today we're talking about money mistakes that creative entrepreneurs make. And trust me, I've made them all. So when I talk about other creative entrepreneurs, I'm including myself in that picture as Brad can attest to. Me too. I, I, I'm going to put that, I'm going to put that label on me too. I've, I, I made all the mistakes right there with you. So. <laughs> so welcome to episode two of the Path to Profit podcast. We're pretty excited about this show. If you haven't seen our first episode where we share more about our personal story and more about what is the Path to Profit Academy and why are we so passionate about this topic, I encourage you to go check out that introductory episode. And I, why are we talking about money? I guess that's the, the question I want to lead with, Brad. So from your perspective, you know, I know we're going to talk about the five money mistakes we see entrepreneurs make. But before we get there, why does money matter so much? Uh, well, <laughs> it, it just means so much. It's the lifeline of a business. Um, I mean, we're not talking about this isn't the path to nonprofit. <laughs> you know, we're, that's, a, that's a good way to put it. Um, you know, so part of our personal story is that we owned a publishing company for 11 years and it was like having a not for profit because we were grossing hundreds of thousands of dollars and didn't have a lot of profit to show for that. Not a lot of money left over at the end after working really, really hard, you know, really staying on top of our deadlines, putting a lot of energy and focus in and always having this mistaken belief that if we just sold one more ad or one more booth or one more sponsorship, that we'd finally have some money left over and working harder and selling more was not the answer. Yeah, it just doesn't, growth is, is not, is not a, an effective strategy to take home more money um, in, unless you already have, unless you already understand profit margins and, and you have uh, a clear picture of, of how that will work. You know, I remember, and this, this jumps forward a little bit in our story, but um, I remember Manette and I in the car listening. We love to listen to audible audio books. We're the old books on tape first people first. And then uh, now it's all audible, but we were both listening to Tony Shea. Um, Delivering happiness. Is that what the book was called? Yeah. The, um, you know, talking about Zappos and he was talking about whatever million dollar months and things like that. And, and the company being barely able to make payroll. Um, and I think that was a watershed moment for both of us because we really, we looked at each other and said, this is exactly the same as us. Um, and I had, I, I don't know, maybe later, I had also talked with someone who was in the, the um, car industry, you know, and auto sales. And they said the same thing, you know, they, they spend millions, hundreds of thousands of dollars on ad spend for a local car dealership. And everything is just so close to the bone uh, in terms of profit margins that they're only a month away from, from just cratering their whole business, even though it's a giant business from a gross standpoint. Um, so yeah, I think, like I said, Manette and I looked at each other and, and said, we have exactly the same problems as this business. They're business problems. They're our inability to um, identify uh, where the margins are. Um, and I know Manette, you've, we went on from there to, to find where the margins were in the publishing work that we were doing. Um, I can't remember, you had that story, you talked about um, the, you know, the amount of ads you were giving away. The <clears throat> yeah, that's a, I think that's a great, great example. So I was in 
a mastermind for small business owners at one point. And one of the topics of conversation was what the facilitator of the mastermind called your money dashboard and really understanding what the five or six key numbers were in your business that you needed to be paying attention to. And I thought I knew and I was wrong. And once I figured out what the magic number was that I was missing from my formula, I was actually able to turn that business around and find the profit margins. And the, the magic numbers that I wasn't paying attention to were number of ads sold in partnership or in ratio to number of pages printed. I did a lot of awesome barters. We always had tickets to lots of great events. My kids got different camps and gymnastics and dance and art and theater programs that we bartered advertising for. But I wasn't really conscientious of how much it was costing me to put those ads in the magazine. No regrets about getting all those awesome resources for our kids at the time, yet it really had a much deeper impact on our business than I knew because I wasn't paying enough attention to the financial details or to the right numbers. We were kind of looking at money coming in, money going out, and there was always seemed to be such a challenge with cash flow, which is what I remember from listening to Tony Shea's Delivering Happiness book is that at one point he talked about, oh, you know, if we just had $600,000 in venture capital or angel funds, we would be able to get out of the hole we're in and go to the next level. And for me, that was that aha moment that for Brad and I, it's like it would have been helpful to just have $6,000 to get us out of the hole we were in and maybe get us going to the next level. And it was that consciousness that every small business struggles with the same problems that really, like Brad said, was that watershed or that light bulb moment of looking at ourselves as business owners. I think for a long time, I ran this publishing company more like a hobby than like an official business. And so just making some of those mindset shifts, and so many of them had to do with money. One of the other stories I always love to tell and that I share in my book, The, the Artful Marketer, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see the title, but if you're listening to us on the podcast. You can find it on amazon.com, The Artful Marketer. And in the book, I talk about how I sat across the table from my accountant one year and it was our best year in business. We had grossed over $350,000. And she looked at me and she said, Minette, you know, you really should have been able to pay yourself $77,000 this year. And I just kind of looked at her and I said, <clears throat> where's my money? I was really at that point pretty clueless. That was about five years into the business and we just kept growing. We were putting all our effort and all our focus into just growing and making more money. And the biggest shift came when we realized that there's a big distinction between focusing on making money and focusing on making a profit. And we ended up making a lot of mistakes in that business and having a lot of success. But out of everything that we learned, during that time came our passion for helping coaches, authors, speakers, graphic designers, and other creative entrepreneurs to find the profit in their business. Every business can make a profit, which is why we want to talk about our five money mistakes today. And I have found with the dozens of women that I've been coaching since I started my coaching business and really the hundreds of women I think that we've worked with through our Path to Profit Academy as well as through other programs and trainings that we've offered over the last few years is that no matter where you are in your business, you've got some money blind spots. You've got some things that you aren't looking at and may not even be conscious of. So we're going to share five of those with you on this podcast today. So Brad, you want to share the first one? Yeah, definitely. And, and I think I'd, I'd probably um, add to those remarks just to reiterate, these all apply to us. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and they applied to us when we had the publishing company and, and weren't getting it right. And they apply just as much to us now with the Path to Profit Academy, looking for the margins in our own business. Yeah. Uh, it's a huge focus for us. But yeah, in, in, I love the way Minette presents it in the, in the Artful Marketer. Um, in terms of these five mistakes. Number one is, is not charging enough. Um, and, and as Manette said, this just continues to come up with our clients. Um, and I, I think we could both probably talk about a, a, a number of different reasons for that. Um, they come from, they stem from business reasons, but they also stem from psychological in, in background, uh, like personal background type of, of reasons. Um, Manette, maybe you can 
expound on that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> again, to reiterate the number one money mistake that I see creative entrepreneurs, especially people in service-based businesses like coaches, authors, speakers, and graphic designers is that they're not charging what they're worth. They're not standing in their value. And especially if they're new in business, they tend to really undercharge um, f by the hour. They tend to charge by the hour to not package their, their services appropriately. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But I think that we're so afraid of asking for the sale that we really focus on, oh, if I just cut my prices a little, if I just start out at a lower price point, I'll feel a little bit more comfortable asking for that sale or asking people to invest in me or to pay me. And as someone personally who went from selling advertising for a decade to selling coaching services, it was a big mindset shift and being able to stand in my value and realize what I bring to the table as an awesome business coach. And it was a huge mindset shift to realize that all my business experience and helping other women avoid the same mistakes that I've made along the journey are a big part of the conversation that we have. And I see it over and over and over again, Brad, in so many of the women, you've seen it as well, that we're working with currently in the Path to Profit Academy, is that they are afraid to ask for what they're worth, mostly because of the fear of rejection. Yeah, and they're, and, and they're also... Yeah, there's that core fear, um, you know, that I guess we all have, um, unless you're just a real stud and you practice a lot, you're, you're always afraid of being rejected. I think also um, people use the undercharging with the mindset that it's going to get them more clients by trying to compete at the dollar level. Yeah, absolutely. That, that rejects the value, and especially for creatives, where it's the the value of their service or product is tied directly to their creative abilities. Um, that's 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 letting go of their value. Like Manette said, it's not they're not standing in their value, and you're not. Uh, you know what? If if we went down to Santa Barbara's what is it Sunday Art Walk, and uh, and you go from vendor to vendor looking at, um, at artwork. You'll see artwork in the background of our, our videos here. If you're watching on YouTube, we love paintings and different types of artwork, but you know what? I don't, I don't want to buy a, a beautiful canvas that someone's selling for $3. Um, it makes me Maybe. feel bad for the artist at a garage sale. Yeah. And, and, and I, I just don't know what it is. Um, I heard a great talk on the smart, Par smart passive income podcast yesterday, which I, I suggest to anybody as a fantastic podcast, um, talking with the guy who runs teachable and they said, when you're pricing your courses for on, this is for online courses, um, you know, $99 for a course is, is just a bare minimum. And they found that the more they charged, the more people were engaged and the better quality experience they had. Um, it's so true. The more that people invest in themselves, because really when people hire a coach or um, buy an author or a speaker's program from the back of the room or when they invest in a graphic designer to help improve the look and feel of their business, they're investing in themselves through you right? They're not paying you necessarily. They truly are investing in themselves so that they can grow and get to the next level. And I think that's an important piece to remember. And we're chatting away. And so I think we should go ahead and move on. We could talk about this one all day, but why don't we move on to mistake number two that creative entrepreneurs make with their money, which is giving away their time and services for free. And I think we're all guilty of this. It's in essence the same as I was talking about the barter and the donations for charitable organizations or being a media sponsor. So in a similar way that I gave away uh, space in my magazine for advertising, when you're first starting out in any service-based business, it's so easy to want to give away your services for free. And there's a balance there where if you're brand new, especially if you're a brand new coach, 
it can be really helpful to just get out there and do some coaching, get some des testimonials, and get some experience. But what I see happening more often than not is that we tend to go really long in our sessions or we tend to give more than was promised and we don't charge for the extra. So in the case of a coach, this might mean that for an hour session, they actually are on the phone with the client for an hour and a half. I had a massage therapist that I work with that was regularly doing this. Her massages were scheduled for an hour. She only charged for an hour, but she would often let that massage go to an hour and a half because she felt like the person needed it. But she didn't have the confidence to say, listen, we're at an hour. I feel like you could use a little more. Are you interested in going for another half an hour? That'll be another $55. And so giving away her time really stopped her from making a profit in her business because she wasn't getting paid for that extra time. And suddenly her price per hour went from being, you know, $100 an hour to $50 an hour. So it's a, a big, big difference. It can waste a lot of time. And it really, I think, goes right back to not charging what you're worth and not standing in your value. Definitely, definitely. I think another couple examples, um, you know, we talk about graphic designers, Yes. Or, um, or, you know, maybe you're someone who does uh, house staging, you know, or, or uh, you know, design for, for furniture. Like what, are the, what, are the, what are the people that... Interior, interior designers. That's right. And, and so, you know, you schedule an appointment or you're a graphic designer, you schedule an appointment, you talk to the client for half an hour, you get some ideas. And then you go back and you spend 12 hours on that, but you only charge them for the, you know, the the one hour session or, or, or it's all this hidden time or a graphic designer similar, you, you know, you, you spend an extra 30 hours dealing with the client because there's so much back and forth on proofs and you never set a boundary of, okay, you get to modify the proof. Is that what it is? Proofs, yeah, right? It is. It's um, you get two or three corrections, like on a logo design and right. that's it. And so it forces both the client and the graphic designer to be crystal clear up front about what it is that they're creating. Boundaries. Boundaries are huge. When it comes to talking about money, boundaries is a big part of, of the conversation. And I think boundaries also have a big impact on mistake number three that <laughs> all of us make around money, which is afraid to be perceived as salesy. And so Brad, I'll let you talk about this one because I know it's one that you're probably still working on. Oh, definitely. Um, I'm, I'm by far the, the introvert of, of us as a couple. Um, and I, I think to my core, and I, this is probably a childhood, and I know it's a childhood thing, but I, I hate to impose on people. Um, it's just the way I am. It's kind of how I grew up. Maybe it's a Canadian thing, old school. I don't know, but um, it's yeah, real Brad's hard. Brad's Canadian, by the way. I got my red on. <laughs> for those of you on YouTube. Um, anyways, the yeah, it's really hard for me to to feel like I'm pushing something or make, trying to make a sale. And it, so I do the digital marketing side of, of the Path to Profit Academy. And even in that, I recognize that I'm, I'm struggling to actually make that final um, conversion to... To self. actually make the offer. It's not yeah, even the conversion. To it's together. to actually make the offer, to put the buy button on the website so yeah. that people can actually buy whatever it is that you're selling. And it, it's a, it's a, like a mental block that I have to work through. And, and once again, we see this a lot with our clients. They're yeah. just, um, they're not able to stand in their value. A lot of it is self-confidence and, and practice. Clearly it's practice, but I don't think they understand one of the keys, which is that when you're talking to someone who has drunk your Kool-Aid. You're talking to your ideal client, someone who, who really identifies with your messaging, what your service is, what you're providing. Um, it, it's, not a, it's not salesy. Yeah. Um, you're, you're just working through a, a, an agreement. Um, they, they've already decided to, what, how was it you put it, Minette, where they, they, 
they're doing this for themselves. They've already decided to invest in themselves. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's um, it's so interesting because one of the the things that I'm seeing with so many clients these days is they're experts and they've invested a lot of time, a lot of energy, usually a lot of money in honing their craft, whether it's massage, design, coaching, writing, speaking, teaching, uh, nurturing others, caretakers, acupuncturists, whatever the industry is that they're in, they're incredible technicians. They're brilliant at whatever their, their talents and their gifts are. But because they may be new at building business, they suddenly put themselves right back in that beginner space and they forget that they truly are bringing their expertise to the conversation, whatever that expertise may be. And also really integrating, it's one, of my, it's one of my themes this year, and I see this with so many people, is that even if the work that you're doing currently isn't a direct match or doesn't flow out of some of the expertise in the other industries and areas that you've worked in in the past, it all contributes to making you the brilliant person that you are today. And that has tremendous value for people on the other end. So while you might be a beginner at marketing or you might be a beginner at creating a business and putting some of those business building blocks in place, you're not new at whatever your gift or talent is. And that's the feeling and space of expertise that you want to come from when you're having a conversation with someone about working with them. And the hard truth about being in business, and this was one I had to learn really fast in 2002 when I started my publishing company, was that if you're in business, you're in the business of marketing and sales. That if you don't master marketing and sales, you don't have a business. You might have a hobby or a nonprofit, but you will not have a profitable business. So overcoming some of that interior, internal mindset, fear around being perceived as salesy is crucial to getting to the next level in your business. Yeah, and, and that's, that's something we focus on um, at our Path to Profit Summit and with our clients in uh, ongoing live events that we work. I mean... It was, what last week we had our, our live event up here in Santa Barbara with with twelve fantastic women entrepreneurs. Yeah. So many creative, brilliant people. Yeah, but quite frankly, part of it, and it included me, is is standing up, practicing, talking about how much you charge and and um, what it is you do, um, because we don't all have those skills, and it's a muscle that needs to get worked on. Um, and it, it, it's a huge, it's hugely important to practice it, whether it's something you can do with your spouse or with your kids. <laughs> or just in the mirror, or with your right? Best just friend. standing in the mirror and literally just saying those numbers over and over again. You know, I charge $300 an hour or I charge $500 an hour or I charge $2,500 for a rebranding package, whatever that price is to just say it. And it's okay if you get that little feeling in the pit of your stomach that feels like a stretch. That's normal and it's totally human, but it's not having that feeling in the pit of your stomach coming up out of your mouth so that you people can sense the fear or right. even sense desperation. But the more you say the numbers out loud, the better they will roll off your tongue. Yeah, and, you, and you'll, you'll really notice it um, if you do it with somebody else. And especially someone who knows you well, they can tell when you pause. They can tell when you have that little hiccup in your throat um, because you choked on saying that this service costs twelve hundred and fifty dollars, or this service costs nine thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars. Um, Brad's been listening to me having sales conversations since I started my coaching practice about three, three and a half years ago. And, you know, he'll tell me that if he still hears that little bit of hesitation in my voice, he's like, you know, I heard it again today. And it usually comes when I'm raising my prices and trying to bump my own coaching prices up to the, to the next level. And it's not, it's not the fear of being a um, appearing salesy for me. It's definitely the feeling of, am I good enough? I think that's one of those mindset shifts that still st is there, you know, um, am I good enough? Am I the right coach for this particular client? So a lot of that comes to the foreground. So Brad, do you want to share marketing mistake number four? Yeah. And, and this is a huge one. It's huge. And it's, this is it's probably the basic, biggest one, right? It's as basic as you can get. And that's not being responsible for your finances or as Manette loves to say, being numb to your numbers. Um, this, this is basic stuff. 
you need to, uh, I mean, we didn't have a, we didn't have a bookkeeper set up last year. We didn't have all of our, you know, for the business, all of our finances were, well, there's some of it here and some of it here and we couldn't figure out how much we spent in a quarter and where money was going. And, um, and one of the things we're working on with our sales coach that, that she's put in place is um, just a, a daily two minute meeting between Manette and I that just discusses um, basic numbers and we're, we're, not, we're looking at some, some other key numbers right now, yeah. but we'll definitely be adding sales and expenses, just basic ones daily um, so that we see those things and we're actually able to, to dispassionately look at them, but we know them daily and we we're interested in them daily. It's too easy to get to the point where, and you know what, speaking of that, sweetheart, we, um, we went for a beach walk this morning <laughs> instead of having our numbers huddle. So we got some, we got to do some makeup time for that. That's right. But, uh, but you know, it's, um, it's tracking everything is really crucial. So in that, you know, huddle, as we call it in the mornings, we're looking at things like how many summit signups do we have? We have a, our next summit is coming up in July 15th to 17th. This is 2016 in LA. And we're paying attention every day to how many registrations are coming in, or if there's not registrations coming in, what do we need to be doing about that? How is our email list growing? Is our social media growing? Or are we adding people to all our different channels of social media? Did I get any new clients? How many people did we speak to? Both of us are out networking and connecting. How many people are we connecting with? So as long as we're on top of some of those numbers, it will tell us why we're either making money or not making money. So all the numbers matter, but I'd love to just simplify it, Brad, for people and just say, if you just simply started by tracking income and expenses every month and you can track income every day, there's nothing more motivational than tracking your income every day and starting to see those zeros to make you get yourself in gear and go find some new clients. But tracking the numbers, numbers simply tell a story. And you know, one of the, the things that we love to share with people is we have a healthy money quiz about how healthy is your relationship to money. And, and we'll uh, be happy to share that in the show notes about how you could take that quiz. It's five minutes to just notice what's your internal barometer when it comes to looking at your relationship with money because most of us are numb to our numbers. We don't want to take responsibility. We get scared of the numbers and we don't want to see what's really happening. But the truth is that numbers simply tell a story. And while I don't personally love to collect the numbers, I actually love the story part. So I'm happiest when I do have a bookkeeper or Brad paying attention to the numbers and then I can look at what that bottom line is. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> We're, I guess we're, we share a lot on the, we want to share a lot on this podcast and be as transparent as possible. And, um, Manette and I have never been great with our books. Just never. I, I think the we're getting better. I, I would say that the best we've been able to do is to, um, get our taxes done regularly and it helped a ton to get somebody in place to do that and pay our bills on time. Well, yeah. and, you know, yeah. it's, I mean, we're, but even, it's, even, it's, it's, it's really looking at the level of responsibility that we're willing to take. Right. Or not. But even with that, you know, we, we get everything on auto pay and, and then we forget about it. We forget about the bills that we're paying. We don't know how much is going in and out of the house every day. Um, one thing that's helped me tremendously this year as, as we started with the path to profit and uh, you know, I quit my job and so we don't have my regular income. We're focusing just on income from the business is a book called profit first. And um, I, I would suggest it to everybody who's in business. It will change the way you look at numbers, what it's done for me primarily to start. And there's, it does a lot of things. It gave me a very simple system to be on top of my numbers once every two weeks. Every 10th and 25th of the month, I know that that morning I'm going to work on the numbers. I'm going to pay bills. I'm going to move money around in accounts. I'm going to take profit out. Um, but the biggest part is that I actually just, um, I know that twice a month I'm going to really look at the numbers. So get that book. 
you know, listen to it on audible, buy the book, mark it up. But, um, it will change the way you look at business, uh, from a numbers perspective and it will force you in a great way to, um, spend time with your, your numbers and not have it take over your life. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Great point by Michael Mal, Mal, Mal Kowitz. I think you've got it sitting over there in your office. You can maybe yeah, let me go get it. Show show to people on uh, YouTube. But Profit First, it's been there've been a couple of books we've read this year that have been really life changing. And I think on our bucket list for the podcast would be to be able to interview some of these people that have really helped us look at our business practices. There's, there's, we've read quite a few great ones this year, and we'll continue to share books. We're both um, avid readers. But I want to go right from profit first to our final money mistake that we see entrepreneurs making, because I think it flows beautifully. And it's not having a plan in place. I would say both a business plan, especially a business plan, and not a marketing plan. In our next, in episode number three of our Path to Profit podcast, we're actually going to be talking about our favorite way of doing business planning, which is to create a really simple, really colorful and impactful one-page business plan. We'll be sharing more about that. But what not having a plan in place did for me was that I always felt like I was spinning. I felt really overwhelmed. I didn't have clarity. I didn't have any goals. When I had the publishing company, I wasn't clear about where I was going, what the direction was that I was taking. I just kept working and I'll, I'll never forget one time sitting at our kitchen table having a planning meeting with our office manager and one of our chief salespeople and Brad. And Heidi said, she said, it's like we were digging a ditch and every once in a while we kind of poke our head up out of the ditch and look around and just kind of see what was around us and maybe shift directions a little bit. But then we just went back to digging, but we didn't even know what we were digging for, right? We were just digging for the sake of digging and, and that's how it felt. So if that's how it feels for you in your business, you're probably not making the profit that you want because you don't have specific money goals in place that you're moving towards. And when you don't have a money money goal in place, you can't work backwards to figure out how much to charge. Maybe you don't even know that you're undercharging. You probably have this idea or this concept that, oh, I'd love to make my first six figures or I'd love to get to half a million. We had one client at one of our summits. Or even 20,000. Or 200,000, whatever. But when you look at how much you're charging per client in relationship to the goal that you want to create this year or the amount of money that you want to make this year, there's usually a pretty big disconnect. So having some simple steps in place to help you figure out, can you get there with the business model that you have is really, really crucial. And it's the other big financial mistake I see our clients making. Yeah. And, and this, this, you know, this goes back to um, our, our accountant back in Texas. Christy. Christy, Christy Jefferson, she was awesome. Telling Minette to, you know, put on her big girl panties and, yeah. and, and, Figure it and, out. and also the part about um, not treating your business like a hobby. It's okay to have a craft business that you treat as a hobby. That's fine. But if you want to move your business forward and grow it and, you know, maybe get your spouse out of that job that they hate because you're finally able to make the money that you want. Um, you have to transition away from treating it like a hobby and have it, uh, have a plan in place, a plan in place for your marketing, for your numbers, a plan in place for you to learn the business skills that you need. Um, and, and you know, you, you just, Unless you're genius level and um, somehow your art or your creativity it, it magically converts into phenomenal profits, if you're like the rest of us, um, you need those skills in place. You need a plan in place. That's what we work on on the summits. Um, you know, when people come in, they're 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 just like Manette was. You know, treating things as a hobby. Um, when they leave, they have that basic plan in place. They know where they're going. They know what they want to do. Um, and, and that's kind of, kind of the journey we want to take you on on this podcast as well is to work on those things and interview people that, uh, 
that are on that path as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So the first couple of episodes will be just Brad and I, but pretty soon we'll be bringing on other experts to contribute to the conversation about how to build a profitable business and about the six key areas that we think that it takes you're focusing on in order to get there. And as we mentioned, we have a summit coming up in July in LA. We're going to be doing another one in September here in beautiful Santa Barbara. So, and they're basically free to attend. We invite you to come and play with us. You can find more out about the summits at pathtoprofitacademy.com. And Brad, any last words? Remember in our next episode, we're going to be talking about our one-page business plan. But other than that, any other tips or things you want to share about money? No, I, th I think we, we, we covered a lot today. Um, you look fantastic for anybody that's watching on YouTube, and that looks great. Her hair well, is really you're, you're a sweetie. I was, <laughs> we just came back from the beach, literally. No makeup, no shower, still in my, my t-shirt from wa walking on the beach. But this is the lifestyle that we choose to live. We're getting it all in and making uh, walking on the beach a little more important than shower and makeup this morning. So we hope you all have an amazing day. I'm Dr. Minette Riordan. And I'm Brad Dobson. And we're the Path to Profit Academy. See ya.